thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, apologies for joining late. I just caught the um, last speaker, Mitzi, and, and the end of the one before. Um, and obviously some of what I will say will overlap with that. So I'll skip through some of that because I also want to come on to solutions and give some examples of quite concrete solutions that can give us hope because I think it's very easy to feel overwhelmed on this subject. I do a lot of public speaking about it. And um, the alarmism, uh, it, it, uh, you know, can really paralyze one. So um, the climate crisis has been called a crisis of a single masculinity. There are only, as the, um, as the sociologist Ray Connell said, masculinities, different masculinities. So I prefer to call it a, a crisis of traditional masculinity. And yes, we've been talking about and hearing about intersectionality. So this is where multiple axes of social inequality intersect based on gender, ethnicity, um, or how people are racialized or minoritized, social class, disability, sexual preference and identity, and age. Age is often left out of intersectionality. And um, that was the rallying cry at the COP in Bali in 2007. No uh, climate justice without a gender justice. Um, yes, I, I like to emphasize the fact that we're talking about gender and not sex here. We're not talking about chromosomes, biology or anatomy, um, good women, bad men, nothing like that. We're not talking about individuals. Um, I mean, there are moments in this debate where that are about sex. For example, Pakistan, recently a third of it was underwater, what Antonio Guterres of the UN called climate carnage. And 675,000 pregnant women were cut off from any access to midwives or, or, or doctors or any form of medical help. Well, obviously that is to do with reproductive function. Um, so I, th that's the exception, but generally we're talking about um, gender here. Um, and um, I really, uh, this is probably, I, I agreed with almost every word that Mitzi said. Uh, this is where I get a little anxious. Um, because the idea of Mother Earth often brings with it the idea of Earth mothers and the idea that somehow women um, have got some kind of caring gene and therefore are more likely to be looking after the planet um, than men. Well, yes, uh, there is a lot of evidence that that's true, that women actually, there's a lot of robust research that, that shows that women, particularly uh, poor women of color, but most women are less liable to take risks than men, um, less of risk takers. And that I think is to do with the fact that women are, are, are in climate disaster uh, and uh, when things fall apart because of their responsibilities in the home and uh, towards uh, caring for, for um, children and elders. So it's not that there's a caring gene, but there is an unequal distribution of caring responsibilities. Um, now, before I really get going, I want to talk about a little bit about how uh, the, the kind of dominant uh, discourse, if you like, around the climate crisis. And let me give you an example from um, a British um, uh, uh, environmentalist, uh, major public figure, David Attenborough, who is regarded as almost a saint in the UK. And this is what he had to say. This is now our planet run by humankind for humankind. We've not just ruined it, we've destroyed it. This is what I call the climate we. It, it's, it's the idea that we're all in it together and we all have to get together. And when you start to talk about gender and climate crisis, I've encountered, uh, as other uh, feminist writers have, a lot of resistance. People say, well, I see people say, 
but even women uh, among those people say, well, hold on a minute, we're facing catastrophe. We're on the edge of, you know, the end of human civilization as we know it. This is not a time for factionalism, for sectarianism, for um, special interests. We can deal with gender later. We're all in it together. Well, we're not all in it together because some of us have been more responsible for causing it. And some of us can protect ourselves much more against the consequences. So when Greta Thunberg said, our house is on fire, some climate activists from the global south said, hold on a minute, our house has been on fire for a very long time. You in the global north just didn't notice it because it wasn't affecting you. So this is the, 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 the climate we, and it obscures um, the, the, the gendered um, impact of the climate crisis, causes and solutions. I'm not gonna to spend too long on, um, on, on this part of my presentation because Mitzi's covered um, a lot of it. So um, here's Aisha, She's, uh, she lives in Ethiopia. She's uh, what I call a water pilgrim. She's 13. She gets up at 8.30 every day. She used to, it used to take her about four hours, three to four hours to collect the water for the household. Since the climate crisis has aggravated and deepened extreme weather events like floods, cyclones and drought, it now takes her eight hours a day and she's had to drop out of school. No education, formal education for her. She has to do these tasks. Women and girls are 14 times more likely than men to die in disasters like floods and drought. Um, again, um, disasters that are not caused by the climate crisis, but amplified and intensified by them. And they're, um, they're more likely to die um, for all kinds of reasons, such as the fact that they may not have been taught to swim because uh, there is a cultural prohibition against that, or to climb trees. Their clothing, like long salaries, can impede them. Um, and they have responsibility for household, so they may be picking up cooking um, pots and trying to carry um, children and elders. Um, And also we know that the climate crisis is increasing the number of child brides um, because uh, families can't afford to, um, to feed them. And also, I think Mitzi alluded to this, the increase in um, climate violence. So women are displaced. Um, migration, the main cause of migration is the climate crisis. When you are in an emergency shelter separated from your network, your family, your neighbors, um, you are much more at risk of the problems. Now, there's a problem with this narrative, and it's the one of depicting women as victims accurate and true, but it's only part of the picture, because if women are vulnerable to the climate crisis, it's because, as the um, writer Susan Buckingham has said, they are made vulnerable, we are made vulnerable. There's not an innate vulnerability. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, so I, I treat that narrative with a great deal of caution. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I don't have time here really to discuss the gendered causes of the climate crisis. But if you look at, um, as I, I go through in, in my book, um, How Women Can Save the Climate, um, uh, the planet, I look at, um, for example, the male fossil fuel companies, um, entirely dominated by um, older, mostly white men. If you look at the financial institutions that are bankrolling them, the banks, the um, financial um, institutions, the insurance companies, again, um, dominated um, by by um, men. Um, uh, men also drive the majority of the men's cars, eat more meat than women, 
and are more likely to be frequent flyers. I mean, meat is very interesting. I don't know if any of you know the work of Carol Adams, um, the American writer, who looked at how um, meat is uh, associated, has become a symbol of a kind of extreme masculinity to the extent that um, companies that have been trying to sell vegetarian alternatives to meat, like soya burgers or veggie burgers, have in some instances uh, burgers to make them look more like meat, to make them more appealing to the male market, um, which I find um, rather astonishing. Um, now, um, this isn't because women have fewer selfish genes than men, because many women would adopt exactly the same behavior if they have the opportunity to do so. So um, it, 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 it's wrong to see this as some, um, some virtuousness um, intrinsic to women. Again, I'm trying to get away from the, the, the stereotyping of men and women and from the essentialism that sees women in this particular. Okay, so what are some of the solutions to the climate crisis, particularly those advanced by men? Well, among the most popular are uh, geoengineering solutions. And these are, are, are grandiose plans that to, to, to hack the planet. So for example, are you, can I sell you a giant space um, umbrella to shield us from the sun? Or um, submarines to go and refreeze the poles? And I could give you a lot more, far more extreme examples of this, which are taken seriously. Um, there's a, a center at the University of Cambridge for climate solutions that is treating these solutions quite seriously, um, even though there is a lot of alarm around them because we don't know what the consequences are and they could have a, a very um, negative consequences um, for, the, for the planet. And it always makes me laugh because feminist solutions, they're often told that, oh, they're so unrealistic. And then you look at these examples that are taken um, seriously. Um, now, another thing that has happened throughout the whole date is the feminization and this. So it's all about changing individual behavior and focusing on consumption. And behind that idea is the idea that women are shoppers in cheap. And if they are sensible and shop around, we can sort of buy our way to a sustainable planet through this kind of careful, um, housewifery, if you like. Um, so this is the idea that, you know, through our consumption, we can change things. And of course, what it obliterates is the fact that we can only consume what is produced. And if the fossil fuel uh, producers continue to extract fossil fuels and burn them, there's, you know, if I buy a dress that isn't made out of polyester, or something that isn't wrapped in plastic, it's not going to make any difference at all. Um, so and also worries me about this narrative. And I was really, <coughs> excuse me, reluctant to call my book, How Women Can Save the Planet, because it sort of buys into that narrative. But, you know, unfortunately, my, my otherwise excellent um, publishers persuaded me. Um, so this is the idea that women are saviors. And it's particularly the idea that young women are going to save us. And this is a terrible burden to put on young women. And we, we know how much young women have suffered through the, the, um, through the pandemic, how the levels of mental health problems have risen, um, they're already beleaguered through social media and there is an enormous rise in eating disorders. And now in their spare time, we want them to save the planet. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, um, and then we come um, um, 
uh, sorry, so I think I've, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I have another name for this. I call it blame the Dane. Because if you say that the responsibility to save the planet lies on women, then the, um, the other side of that is that uh, if it's not saved, it's women's fault. Um, and let me uh, talk about one other part of this narrative, and that is, sorry, that doesn't seem to be showing very well. Um, but this is the idea of the individual carbon footprint, um, which all sounds, again, very, um, you know, who, who could disagree with this? Um, but actually, yeah, you know, and it's the idea that you calculate, you know, what your individual carbon emissions are so that you can reduce them. This was an idea um, dreamt up in 2004 by Ogilvy and Mather, a leading uh, advertising agency who were working for BP, British Petroleum. And what a wonderfully useful idea it is. Let's shift attention from BP, who are, you know, the bad guys, if ever there was anyone, and let's put it on our individual footprint. Okay. And then here's another part of the false solutions. Um, Prince William talks about um, overpopulation is having a catastrophic effect on the natural world. This, by the way, was in 2017 when he was expecting his third child. Um, and here I, I point to the work of, of Sasser, who uh, observed that none of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa with high fertility rates, for example, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Ethiopia, figure in the world's top 75 greenhouse, top 75 greenhouse gas emitting nations. And you know, the, the solution that is put forward here is we need to educate women. Well, I mean, who's going to object to educating women unless you're a member of the Taliban? But in fact, um, this is an idea that we want to educate women, really, not because we believe it's a good thing in itself, but because we believe, and there is evidence that educated women have smaller families. Well, I'm sorry, reproductive rights should be um, incontestable, and we shouldn't be trying to get women to have fewer babies to save the planet. When um, me, with my two children in the global north, is producing far more uh, damage to the planet than a vast family in Malawi or Senegal could ever do so. Okay, so um, now you might think, yes, the majority of young climate activists are women, and it's true on the streets they are, um, but when it comes to the top tables where uh, women were made, um, that's not the case. And as Mitzi pointed out, I mean, look at the UN FCCC committees, the, the proportion of women um, have been going down. Um, you're lucky if there are 20% uh, women, let alone 5%, let alone 50%. Okay, so I just want to quickly, if I may, as I started a little bit late, um, go on to look at some real solutions. Um, this is one, um, She Changes Climate, that is um, trying to, but there are a lot of other um, fascinating solutions. And we have to bear in mind what the American writer Audre Lorde said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So we cannot use the same tools and weapons we use and strategies that we that got us into this mess to get us out. So here is a brilliant project in Gujarat, Gunguru. In Gujarat, they have um, floods followed by um, drought. Uh, this is a project, a technology that saves the water and uses it for when there's drought. It takes the poorest, lowest caste women, Dalit women, and trains them to uh, teach other people to use them. As a result, these women have gained irrigation rights, land ownership rights, and much higher social status. Um, the 15-minute city, which Annie Dalgo is trialing, 
um, in Paris, uh, Portland, Oregon, countries around the world are trialing, whereby the urgent, the, the, the essential um, goods and services that you need, uh, education, um, uh, um, uh, work, uh, uh, health care is in with, within a 15 minute um, bike, bike ride or uh, on foot from your home completely reduces at a stroke the dependence on motorized transport and enables people to care and work in a different way. Um, then there's the great Vandana Shiva who reacted to the patenting of um, seeds by uh, uh, giant um, international companies, transnational companies like Monsanto, which has been a factor in the suicides of many male farmers by providing a free um, seed bank. Um, the brilliant Wangara Matai in Kenya, whose green um, belt uh, project uh, has uh, led to women being the forefront of reforestation. Um, Yasmin Lari, um, the Pakistani architect, working with local women um, to counter pollution because the pollution of women cooking inside is terrible, leading to respiratory problems, created uh, using local materials, eco stoves um, that has helped women's health, reduced pollution and made cooking a sociable factor. Um, now, the UNFCCC says, yes, we are committed to, we, all these countries are signing up for five years to a gender action plan. In the same way that the Paris Agreement included, although nominally, um, gender. Um, but the reality is that a lot of this isn't actually being carried out. But there are feminist economists and other groups doing really interesting things. Uh, climate litigation around the world, which is taking the bold, you know, commitments of the climate crisis and the gender action plan and saying, OK, look at the reality. And in that space in between, taking governments and companies to court um, to um, to fight, um, to, to try and get them to live up to their, their, their commitments. I've almost finished. I can talk a bit more later about the Femin feminist Green New Deal. Um, uh, I just want to talk very briefly, I've got about, which is um, a, British, a group of British economists who have talked about putting care at the heart of a green economy. Um, they um, argue that uh, um, care jobs are green jobs and that one pound invested in the national economy um, that is put towards insulation, retrofitting um, houses, all those um, infrastructure changes um, generates less, fewer jobs and is more polluting than 1% invested in care. Care jobs, they argue, are green jobs. We need to redesign our economies around care. And, and lastly, I just want to point uh, out the work of Kate Ray Wernick shows how it is possible to, for everyone in the world um, to have decent housing, decent health, access to enough affordable, healthy food. Um, that's the inner ring. And the outer ring is what the planet can afford. And in that area is where intersectional climate justice is going to be attained. Sorry, I've raced through that, but I got to the end more or less. Thank you.